So in the continuation of uh, Art's presentation about uh, laser uh, trapping and cooling, uh, Steve Chu is going to present, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, some of the work he's done and the work uh, with Jim as well. All right, thank you. Um, so let me, let me just tell you a little bit about what Jim is doing. And uh, some of it will repeat what Art said, I, but uh, I will hopefully go uh, rapidly through this. Uh, but it is, I, I would say, a testament to Art Ashton who dreamed that perhaps you could hold on to neutral particles. Um, that is with, uh, with your fingers or with something remote to your fingers. And can you hold on to them? But if you look at them and look at microscopically at this, what you're really doing is you're holding on to this particle using electric forces or electric and magnetic forces. In particular, the electrons on your fingers and the electrons on this marble or whatever it is uh, are distorted and the strong electric fields then repel each other and that actually enables you to hold on to it. And as you heard from Art Ashkin, he started thinking about holding on to particles and in this FizRev letter paper in 1970, uh, he discussed an experiment where he had two focused laser beams had some particles in some water. And these particles, think of the particles as being pushed on from, a, from some scattering photons on both sides. And so if the particle went a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, uh, it would see, for example, this particle went a little bit over here, it'd see more photons scattering from this beam and be pushed over. If it went over here, it'd see more particles that be pushed over. Well, what kept it uh, centrally located along this dimension? And that's because there is a different type of force. And that different type of force actually polarized the particle. And in its polarization, it, this particle would want to see a region of strongest electric field. Now, this type of force can be thought of quite differently. And it actually comes from a lesson in static electricity. Suppose you take a rod, you charge it up, and you put a piece of paper over here. So here are some pictures of electric fields. This is the charges on the rod. And the electric field slightly distorts the position of the charges on this piece of paper. The negative charges are pulled slightly closer together, closer to the positive rod than the positive rod. Uh, positive charges are pushed away. But because the field is strong over here than over here, what you see is that the piece of paper wants to be attracted to the rod. Uh, now, one can say that the electric field induces some dipole moment, and in the gradient of the electric field, this dipole moment with the electric field wants to pull the piece of paper. Now, I'm going from positive charges to negative charges, and when you go to negative charges, the same thing happens. The positive charges, on average, are pulled a little bit closer to the rod, the negative charges a little bit further away. The induced dipole moment is in the opposite direction, but you're pulled again towards a region of highest electric field. So that's the deal. Next question is, oh, all I have to do is make a region of highest electric field and then the particle will be drawn to it, which is true. But that's not the object anymore. We don't want to touch the particle. We want to hold it at a distance with a magic wand. So this is a magic wand, but it, Eventually, it touches the piece of paper. And so then you have to go to something um, very basic physics. Suppose you drive a harmonic oscillator, and suppose this harmonic oscillator has a resonant frequency. And when you drive this harmonic oscillator, uh, the resonant frequency, how much it absorbs photons, rescatters them, is the absorption line. And then there's a resonant frequency, and the real part of the index refraction has this type of shape. If you drive this harmonic oscillator well below its natural resonant frequency, the driving electric field then is driving the electric charges, but if it's below the resonant frequency, the electric charges keep in step with the driving electric field. And this is the phase of this, and when you tune your laser way down here, or you tune whatever harmonic oscillator you're driving way down here, this is the driving force, the response is in phase with the driving force. If you go above resonance and 
the response is 180 degrees out of phase. If the response is 180 degrees in phase, it's on phase, it's like static electricity. So that was the fundamental idea. Now, it's so it looks pretty easy. Take a laser beam, focus it. At the center of this laser beam, you have a region of highest electric field. Tune the laser below the natural resonant frequency. It's just like static electricity. It's drawn to the region of highest electric field because the charges remain in phase. And um, so it sounds very elegant. It sounds very easy. And then you can ask yourself, why wasn't it done 15 years ago? And it, it, well, it could have been maybe, but here's, there's more to it than that. So another pioneering paper published by Art Ashkin had the following thing. It's the same thing he did with particles, 1970. He took two focused laser beams. This is a proposal written and came out in 1978. A focused laser beam over here. You put an atom in here, a focused laser beam in here. You put an atom in here. You create a standing wave. Again, what confines the atom along this direction is if the atom moves over here, it sees a scattering force, wants to push it towards the center. Oops. And if it sees, if the atom's over here, it wants to push it towards the center. And then the so-called induced dipole force to, wants to bring it to a region of highest laser intensity. And so that was the proposal. That paper uh, discussed that proposal at great length, and there was a little jewel at the end of the paper, part of one paragraph, that finally said there's perhaps the simplest trap. A single highly focused laser beam tuned well below resonance where strong trapping exists. And then here's the caveat. However, the atomic beam injection in such a small trap is difficult. And he goes through some numbers and discovers that if you're lucky, you could at best load one to 10 atoms or even less if low velocities were depleted. And if actual fact is you would load far less than one atom per whatever in this. And so for that reason, it wasn't uh, done. This was paper came out in 1978, and as Art said, uh, by this time, um, Art was a department head, and the director said, this is not going to work. So now, there was more to it as to why it might not work. And this has to do with a truly great paper that Jim Gordon and Art Ashkin wrote. And it's the one that Art talked about. It's the paper that said, it's Physical Review, 1980, and it analyzed the motion of atoms in a radiation trap. And it took a full quantum treatment of how the atoms would interact with an electromagnetic field, and it derived it with 98% full rigor, and I'll get to the 2% or 99.5% full rigor. And it said it derived something, a couple of amazing things. It derived the forces that the radiation field would exert on the atom. It didn't divide it into a scattering force and a gradient force. It just took the whole thing and this we're going to do whatever it is. We're going to do it for low velocities where it mattered, but we'll do it for arbitrary laser intensity. And we'll consider all the quantum fluctuations that occur in these electromagnetic fields. And, and then it finally took those results and discussed what you can do with laser cooling and trapping. Now, for those of you who know me, that you may know that I don't read that many papers, but there's a couple of papers I read very, very intently. And this was one of them. And so I read it. Uh, and then I read it again. And I read it very dense. And uh, let me just show you a little excerpt. I'm not expecting you to read this, but there's an equation in there. And he says, uh, the next step, I'll read you a little bit of it, solving for the field at the atom is plagued by the usual difficulties of quantum electrodynamics. However, we can approximate that field, and he goes along and says. So he gets to equation six. So here I am, you know, like a graduate student, trying to figure out, OK, I'm pretty good in algebra. And, physics, and I should figure out what he did. And uh, couldn't do it. Uh, so I said, eh, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. Finally, I went to Jim. 
and this is where one of the earlier talks really resonated with me. I said, Jim, how did you get, you know, I got this far and I see your result and I understand the result, but how'd you make that step? Jim looks at me, and if those of you know, very quiet, kind of winks at me and said, I knew what the answer was. <laughs> what? <laughs> I knew what the answer was. Had to be. So therefore, you know, plagued by the usual difficulties, you know, this is what the answers are going to be. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I heard that. We, usually, we all heard that a little while ago. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, then how'd you know that? And he said, well, then, we, he, then we started this great discussion where he said, well, don't you agree? There's these three terms and this and this. And doesn't your intuition say it's got to be that? And I said, of course. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> so anyway, I said, oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, but um, so uh, there was this little step. Uh, it might have been cleared up by others. I, I didn't really care. Because then the next thing he said to me still rings true. He said, Steve, what are you doing worrying about this algebra? Do more experiments. I said, yes, sir. That is. And <laughs> uh, so anyway. So um, and it, another this where you could fill in the steps, and we obtain after some algebra the following result. It's the um, expectation value of the force, a very complicated term. And what's amazing about this, again, I'm not gonna go through all the terms, tell you what they mean, but he derived the complete closed expression for the force, not only the dipole force, but the scattering force, the whole kabang, for low velocities at all laser intensities. And he notes in this paper, oh, there's an interesting sign reversal. If you crank up the intensity of the laser field, what used to be uh, a force that cools the atom becomes a force that heats the atom. And he goes on and says, and this, this uh, could have some reverberations, and just mention this as an offhand remark. Now, that was a paper written in 1980. And in a paper written in 1985 by Jean Dalibard, Claude Contenugi, published in Journal of the Optical Society of America B, takes an atom in very, very strong standing laser fields and analyzes what it would do if you tune way off resonance but have very strong fields. And it is a special case of Jim's formula, but his, but his formula was for all detunings and all laser intensities. Just take it, strong detuning off resonance, and they describe what's called a dress state picture of the optical forces. And clearly, the Gordon Ashkin paper had some impact on the authors. Um, you can just see this uh, when you read that paper. Uh, the Gordon Ashkin paper was referenced four times in the first five sentences. Usually, you leave it as reference one and then just leave it as reference one. <laughs> but reference one, reference one, reference one, reference one, reference one. And Jean, I spoke with Jean Dalibard years later, and he said, this was an amazing paper. I, too, read it many, many times. <laughs> and so, um, now, why was it such an amazing paper? It was an amazing paper for a couple of reasons. But what it did was laid out with some rigor, complete rigor, except a little glitch. But it was the right glitch. Um, because I agreed it had to be that way <laughs> uh, for other reasons. But it, so, so it wasn't a complete mathematical proof, but for other, other physics reasons, it just had to be that way. It, it laid out how cold you can possibly get atoms, no matter what, no matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, this is as good as you can get. And it gave a formula at some limit. And so uh, as one began to use light to cool atoms, and as you begin to use light in not only pushing light against atoms, as Bill Phillips and Harold Metcalf did, but if you surrounded the light with atoms, uh, and you could make it to cool them. Uh, this was proposed in 75 by Ted Hansch and Art Shallow. Uh, that paper I didn't read until I started to write the molasses paper. Uh, Art Ashton said, Steve, you know what? The thing you just did, you should read this paper, because it might have something to what you just did. 
and I was heartbroken. <laughs> it had everything to do with what I did. So it became reference one. Uh, but in any case, it worked, uh, and it cooled atoms down to very low temperatures. So, so that began some more serious cooling. This is a picture of the apparatus that was used to cool the atoms. Uh, this is um, a picture of the inside of our vacuum chamber. There's a beam of atoms coming out here, and there's a crisscross of six laser beams, three counterpropagating directions. And you don't see the laser beams because this is in a vacuum chamber. All you see are atoms scattering light. Uh, I have to tell you that in order to take this picture, I had to smuggle a camera into Bell Laboratories. They don't want cameras in Bell Laboratories. And I just uh, put it next to the vacuum chamber, opened the shutter for a quarter of a second, and got this picture. Uh, but it was atoms being cooled to very low temperatures. And then something incredible happened. Well, we measured the temperatures, and we got, with large error bars, something pretty close to what Gordon and Ashkin predicted. There was another paper. There were other papers. Uh, Weinland and Tano had also predicted that you could possibly get this temperature. But the difference was, because Jim had done the full quantum electrodynamic calculation, there was no question that nothing was left out. So we got something close to the minimum temperature. Bill Phillips's group at NIST, using sodium, got something close to the minimum temperature. Carl Wyman's group at Boulder got something close to the minimum temperature, given the difference in line width, to for cesium. And then there were some signs that things weren't working right. Uh, we began to see things where you calculate the diffusion, the hands seem to hang on a lot longer than they should have. Uh, there are some other things that Bill Phillips' group was doing. And then finally, Bill Phillips' group, uh, one of his postdocs, said, let's remeasure the temperature, slightly different way. And they got something not right. They got a temperature maybe six times colder. It was done a slightly different way, but it was, and they did it over and over again, and it was clear it was colder. Uh, news traveled that uh, Bill Phillips and his colleagues were getting temperatures considerably colder. Um, they were duplicated in, by Claude and Claude Clontanuji in his group and by my group and by Carl Wyman's group. And this is what we know in physics as a strong violation of Murphy's Law. In physics, usually you never reach the theoretical minimum and you're always ready for excuses to tell you why you didn't quite reach as good as it gets. But if it gets better than it should have, then you're really at a loss. And this is what happened. And what was clear immediately to all of us was don't bother looking for a loophole in the theory. You have to look for a loophole in the assumptions of the theory. And there was only one assumption in the theory, really. The atom had a ground state and an excited state. But these atoms had more than a ground and excited state. They got a lot of ground states and a lot of excited states. And so uh, because the theory was done so well that we immediately said, that must be the solution. I remember this was now several months later. It's in June, maybe four months after the public note. The people know that these temperatures are there. I gave a talk, and uh, Claude Condonuji gave a talk uh, at a low temperature conference, and we both said it has to do with the fine and hyperfine structures, and indeed it had to do with the hyperfine structure of the ground in an excited state for various experimental reasons. And it had to be something with that. It had to do with optical pumping and the ground and, and excited state hyperfine states, and he agreed. Uh, and he said, do you know what it is? And, no, I don't know what it is, but we're working on it. Okay, so, so then that was in June of, I think, 87 or 80, June 87 or 88. And um, what happened was uh, in two months later, we met in Paris, and um, we were both happy. I met with Jean Dalibard and um, uh, Claude Condonuji, and we both were very happy we figured it out. I'm not going to go into why we figured it out because this is more technical, uh, but let's just say 
it was figured out. Uh, but going back to Jim Gordon, the only thing I want to say about this is when you do something that's a very clear theoretical description of something, it begins to focus on the mind. If something is wrong, if something is goes, you say, this is solid, you, that's a foundation, look elsewhere. And that's why uh, that paper was such a seminal paper. It just, here it is, end of story. Um, and so I'm going to, as Art mentioned, uh, lasers were used to trap atoms. Art discovered you could use lasers to trap uh, bacteria. When I got to Stanford, I said, OK, Art's trapping bacteria. We can trap atoms. Is it possible to trap single molecules using light? This is little beads of DNA strung on uh, in an optical microscope. And this is uh, a movie taken about 1990 of a piece of DNA hung on a one micron bead. Uh, we got an undergraduate uh, student at Stanford to hook up a little motorized joystick to a bunch of motorized mirrors. We suck the laser in the microscope, and then you can play computer games. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things that happen in laser and cooling, especially after the magneto-optic trap. There are atomic fountains and primers. The whole thing exploded. But uh, let's go back to Jim. You've seen this famous picture of Jim and Charlie and the Mazer. Um, remember a bunch of stories. I'm not sure whether I heard them from Charlie or heard them from Jim about uh, these things um, and how this thing actually finally got to work. Uh, but this is the classic picture. There's another picture that I like also of Charlie, a more theatrical picture uh, posed with the Mazer. And, and I always said to myself, I've seen that somewhere before something that important. And I say, I know what it is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the laser was a big deal, <laughs> and the maser. Uh, I, wanna, I, I just want to go back and, and, and say that, uh, um, as been noted, Jim was a th three-time national uh, platform tennis champion. That's him in his raccoon coat. Uh, a fantastic tennis player. I had the privilege of playing with Jim uh, tennis several times. Uh, he um, uh, took me to his club uh, in New Jersey. It was a lawn tennis club. It was the tennis club where William Tilden and Jack Kramer won the national championships. And Jim was very, very thoughtful. He said, Steve, you know, it'll be great, you know, play tennis here. Um, but I have to warn you, I have to tell you two things. Uh, number one, sometimes you wear not pure white clothing, pure white. <laughs> you know, the Lacoste thing might have been okay, but nothing more colorful than a little alligator. <laughs> uh, and the other thing he said is, you're probably going to be the first Chinese they've seen. <laughs> so brace yourself for this. <laughs> And so he took me a couple of times into the locker room, and I think I probably was a version of Chinese <laughs> thing. Uh, but he was very gracious. Um, and I'd, again, if you haven't, it, it was such a pleasure to know Jim. He played tennis the way he did physics, with hardly any wasted motion, at least the way you read his papers. It was an amazing thing. I mean, this guy, and he wasn't so much a fast server. I think he was more a sneaky server. <laughs> uh, and and then he would licky split before you even know it. You kind of you think he's ambling, but all of a sudden his nose is hanging over the net, and and that's it. And then he and then you think you can get the ball by him, and then no, he's over and just and very quietly without any fuss, he's covering everything, and he's trouncing you, and he invites you again, <laughs> and. Uh, and then we played tennis several times. Uh, I never played doubles with him. Like Herwig, uh, you know, had the privilege of that. But, but then, he's, then he looks at me and he has this little quiet smile and says, Steve, you want to play platform tennis? <laughs> I was smart enough. <laughs> no, it's okay if you just trounce me in tennis. 
But anyway, uh, he's a fantastic tennis player. Uh, fed, uh, Fantastic tennis player, but so much, the only thing I think, so much the gentleman in the way he did it. He, he, he did it quietly without any fuss. Uh, he didn't gloat about it. He just kind of trounced you and tried to say, it's okay. Uh, you had an off day. <laughs> but you want to play again? <laughs> anyway, um, let me just say, uh, so... Uh, it was remarked, and Towns has said it several times, that Jim Gordon was deserving the share of the Nobel Prize. And Jim said, it would have been too much too soon. Uh, but I don't think he really cared. I think what was great about Jim is deep down in his heart, he knew how good he was. And the last lack I should tell you is when I was going from Mary Hill to Homedale, I was being invited down there after five years in Mary Hill. And the people at home that said, you shouldn't go, you shouldn't go, you should stay here. And I said, no, no, it sounds like an exciting opportunity. And there was a little bit of rivalry and snobism, snobism and Mary Hill rivalry uh, between the two labs. And uh, Bill Brinkman, one of my mentors there, uh, said, no, Steve, it's okay, you should go down to Homedale. It's good that we mix. Uh, but there's someone he said, there, was, there are a bunch of really smart people in Homedale. Surprisingly, not all the people in Mary Hill felt that way. <laughs> but he said, no, they're really smart people. But there's one really, really smart people, person. And you've got to get to talk to him. You've got to know him. And you've got to work with him. And his name's Jim Gordon. Thank you.